Today, I'm continuing a series about the believer's authority. And this is going to surprise somebody, but we're going to talk about who made Satan. And of course, most people, well, of course, God created Satan. God created all the angels. He created people. God did everything. I believe that God created Satan, but He didn't make Satan. Now, that needs a little bit of explanation, and that's what I'm wanting to do. Now, before I get into this, let me just, first of all, kind of summarize what the dominant thinking about where Satan came from is. And uh, this could vary. There are people, of course, that have varying opinions on this, but the dominant thing that I've heard, and I've been around this for 30-something years, I've heard a lot of people minister on Satan, where he got his power, where he got his authority from. I've read commentaries, Bibles on this, and different things. And the dominant, uh, probably the dominant theology or doctrine on this is that God, of course, created Satan. I agree with that 100%. Or He created, uh, actually, He created Lucifer. That would be a better way of saying this out of uh, Isaiah chapter 14. I believe it's verse 12. It was talking about the king of Babylon, but it actually was using that symbolically to refer to Satan. And it makes it very clear in Isaiah 14, 12. Let me just turn over here and read this passage. Uh, I'm not going to take time to read the entire uh, passage because we'll do that later as we go and talk about Satan and his transgression. But in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? So this is definitely talking about Satan. It uses the term Lucifer here. And I believe that God created Lucifer. But as we will go into more detail, I'm just going to say some things quickly here, and then I'll come back and substantiate it by Scripture later. But Ezekiel chapter 28 shows that Lucifer was a godly angel. He was a very powerful angel. Matter of fact, Ezekiel 28 says he was the anointed cherub that covered. And he had all of these pipes and tabrets built in him. Some people believe that that's actually talking about that he had like musical instruments built into his body, if that's what you want to call it. And uh, he was this powerful anointed angel. I believe that that's who God created, a godly angel named Lucifer. Now, most people believe that there was a transgression by Lucifer against God. And they uh, say that he took one-third of the angels. Probably many of you have heard these exact same things, that Satan took one-third of the angels and charged God and tried to overthrow God and was defeated by God. Where they get this from is over in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. There's only one scripture in the entire Bible that even makes a reference to this. And let me just say up front that to use one passage of scripture and make a major doctrine on it is not good Bible interpretation. And plus, you can see in Revelations chapter 12 that all of the things that are being said here about this dragon, which I believe is talking about Satan, but it's all symbolic. For instance, here in Revelations chapter 12, um, verse 3, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, this is the only reference that I'm aware of. And I, I may not know everything in Scripture, but I've read the Bible hundreds of times. I've studied it. And I've read other people's teaching on this. And this is the only Scripture I've ever heard anybody use to say that Satan took one-third of the angels and challenged God. Now, I'm not sure exactly all of the things that this says, but again, this is symbolic. And for us to take something that is obviously symbolic and to make a major doctrine out of it, is uh, not very good Bible interpretation. But most people believe that Satan got one-third of the angels to rebel, charged God, and was defeated and thrown down here to the earth, and that Satan literally ruled over a civilization that existed before the creation of Adam. Many people, Phineas Dake is the one that really popularized this in the 1800s, and in, in Dake's Bible commentary, 
He has extensive notes on this, and this is where most people got a lot of this teaching from. They believe that in between Genesis 1-1, where it says God created the heavens and the earth, and Genesis 1-2, that the earth was void and without form, they believe that there was a cataclysmic judgment by God upon Lucifer and his kingdom, and that the earth was completely destroyed. And actually, Genesis 1-2 is the recreation or the reformation of the world. That's what most people believe. And they believe that this is where Satan had his transgression, that demons came from this pre-Adamic civilization, and that that's where Satan originated from. And then, when Adam and Eve were created, Satan was allowed down here on this earth uh, with all of his evilness and all of his corruption that God allowed him in the garden so that man would have a choice between good and evil. And so in a sense, it's like, you know, uh, God taking his man, putting them in the garden with this wild beast, this evil being there, uh, just to tempt them to see how they would do. You know, I've, I don't know if you have thought about these things. I think sometimes most people don't really give serious thought to why things are the way that they are. They just deal with stuff on the surface level. But I'm sure that there's some of you that have thought before about if God is a good God and a loving God, why did He allow Satan to come down here on the earth and tempt Adam and Eve? That seems like it's an unfair thing. To me, it's comparable to me taking a little one- or two-year-old child and letting them go out and play in the backyard knowing that there is a lion or a bear or something there that could literally destroy them, kill them. You know, we would consider that to be irresponsible. In the natural realm, we would take children away from a parent that didn't protect and take care of their children any better than that. And yet here we are saying that God turned Satan loose in the Garden of Eden to tempt Adam and Eve. I don't believe that's the way that it was at all. So how did it happen then? You know what I believe? I believe that Satan, when he was on the earth in the Garden of Eden, was still Lucifer. I believe that he was God's top angel. That God sent him there not to be a temptation to Adam and Eve, but rather to be a blessing to them. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says that all of the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Angels are all sent to minister to us. And I believe that God sent Lucifer to this earth not to tempt Adam and Eve, but as an angelic being to be their protector, to minister to them, to serve them, to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. He was there on a godly, divine mission. And he transgressed in the Garden of Eden. Now, here's some scriptures that will back this up. This is out of uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. And um, in verse 11, Ezekiel 28, 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, now, this is speaking to the king of Tyrus, but the same thing is done in Isaiah chapter 14 where it talks about the prince of Babylon or the king of Babylon. And there in Isaiah 14, 12, it literally says, You are Lucifer. And so that shows you that even though it was addressing a, a physical person, it was actually talking about the demonic power that was behind them. This is similar to what Jesus did with Peter in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew when he looked at Peter, but he says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not savoring the things that are of God, but the things that be of men. So it was similar. Here it is talking about the king of Tyrus, but as we read through this, you'll see some of these things make it very clear that this is not really talking about the physical person, but about the demonic power, I believe Satan himself, that was operating through this king of Tyrus. So this is talking to Satan, and it's obvious by the things that are said. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. 
Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniqui- until iniquity was found in thee. And this is describing Satan specifically, it says, in the Garden of Eden. And it describes him still in a sinless, perfect state. So what I believe happened here is that instead of God sending Satan down here and loosing Satan in his creation, in this garden to tempt Adam and Eve, I believe instead God sent Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covered, one of the most uh, honored, respected angels that he created. He sent him down here to the Garden of Eden to be a servant to mankind. And here's something that's going to startle some people because, again, we've accepted so many things as being, thus saith the Lord, it's the way it is, when really I don't believe that Scripture bears it out. I believe that Satan's transgression against God came in the Garden of Eden. And that's described in Genesis chapter 3. When Satan entered into this snake and used the serpent to speak to Eve and to tempt her and then got Adam and Eve to both eat of the forbidden fruit, I believe that that's when Satan transgressed against God. I really do. And here is the logic behind all of this. Again, I use the Scriptures already in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, where it says that this dragon took one-third of the stars and threw them to the earth. From that, which is a very flimsy basis for getting this, but a lot of people teach that that's where Satan took one-third of the angels and rebelled against God. Satan wouldn't have won if he had had 100% of the angels, much less one-third of the angels left. Satan could not win a direct confrontation with God where he assaults the position of God. Instead, what he did, I believe that Satan, as an anointed angel here on the earth to minister for Adam and Eve, saw in Adam and Eve something that he didn't have. And I'm going to spend more time talking about this later on as we get into this series, but real quickly, let me just say it this way, that Satan's power and authority that he had was conditional. There is no reason to believe that angels were created in the same way that man was. When man was created, man was given unconditional authority over this earth. Let me just give you some scriptures here that will verify this over in Genesis Chapter 1, where God created Adam and Eve. Here's, here's the creation story, Genesis chapter 1, and in verse 26. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so God here, when he created man, he gave them dominion, power, and authority over the earth, and there are no restrictions placed on this. He didn't say to them, now as long as you will follow my leading and as long as you do what I want you to do, I will let you have dominion over the earth. There were zero qualifications on this. And I've got to counter some things here because most people don't recognize some of these things about God. Many times we transpose onto God our own human characteristics and weaknesses of a fallen nature. But God isn't like that at all. The Scripture says in uh, Psalms chapter 89, verse 34, He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. What this means is that God cannot lie. It says that in Hebrews chapter 6. God cannot lie. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that God upholds all things by the word of His power. I could spend a lot of time on this, but basically those things are saying that it's God's Word, the integrity in His Word that makes the universe consist and hold together. God cannot lie. God will not violate what He says out of His mouth. So when God said, you have dominion, you have authority, you have power, you rule, you subdue it, it's under your control. 
God never intended for man to use that power and authority the way that we did and to turn it over to Satan. But because of God's own integrity, he could not lie. He would not just say, like we would many times, King's X, time's out. This isn't what I intended. Stop. We're going to do it over. I take back this authority. You can't run the earth anymore. See, that's the way that we would tend to do it if somebody abused the privilege that we gave them. But that's not the way that God is. God was bound by His own Word. It says in Psalms chapter 138, verse 2, that the Lord has magnified His Word above His name. At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. It's a high tower. The name of Jesus is powerful, and yet the Word of God is magnified even above the name of Jesus. What an awesome statement. God cannot lie. God cannot change. So when the Lord said, you have dominion, and he didn't put any qualifications, no restrictions on it, I think that all of a sudden Satan's antennas went up. Actually, he was Lucifer at this time. And he saw that, you know what, his power and his authority that he had to use that God-given power were all delegated. And if he would have disobeyed God, well, then his power would have instantly been taken away. He had no ability to use the power that God had given him to fight against God. He couldn't do that. There was zero chance of Satan directly rebelling at God. But what he saw was, here is a created being, Adam and Eve, who have unconditional authority and power. I believe that Lucifer, there is, from everything I can understand, and some of these things aren't clearly spelled out in Scripture, and so I admit I'm bumping right up on the edge of saying some things that, you know, maybe it's uh, beyond our ability to know. God didn't reveal every single thing to us. But it looks like to me in Scripture, this Bible talks about over in the book of Peter, that angels who sinned and didn't keep their first estate were condemned by God and reserved in chains unto final judgment. And so it shows that uh, angels had a free will but they didn't have the power and the authority that were given to angels. There is no reason to believe that this was an unconditional authority. In other words, if they got out of line, God could just, in a sense, fire them. God could cancel the power and the authority that He's given them and recall all of that, and they were absolutely defeated. I think it was impossible for Satan, with one-third of the angels, to charge God on his throne, who retained two-thirds of the angels. But what he did, he saw in Adam and Eve that God had given them authority over this earth to rule it with zero restrictions. In a sense, God made Adam and Eve the God of this world. Let me give you some scriptures that will say this. matter of fact, Jesus even quoted one of these when he was being criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees. But in Psalms chapter 82 and verse 6, it's talking about man and it says, I have said, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. If you were to take this in context, it's talking about God creating man. And he's saying to man, he says, you are gods. Not a capital G, not in the sense of divinity, but we were created in the image of God and we were given so much power and authority over this earth that it was ours to rule. In a sense, we were a God over this earth. Here's another scripture that will go along with that and verify it. And that's Psalms 115 and verse 16. And that scripture says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. This verse says that God gave the earth to mankind. He gave it to us. He literally gave us the authority to rule this earth as if we were the Creator. We weren't the Creator. He is the Creator. But He gave us that much power and authority over this earth. And it didn't have any restrictions on it. No limitations. And so I believe that what Lucifer saw, still the, the sinless, the perfect, uh, angel of God in the Garden of Eden, there to serve man. I think he saw an opportunity. As a matter of fact, I'll deal with some of these scriptures later on, but if you read over in Isaiah chapter 14, it kind of gives you the thought process that Luz- Lucifer went through. And Lucifer, 
He envied God. He says, I will be like the Most High God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of the heaven. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will all of these things. He was jealous of God. He was one of the most powerful angels, and yet he wasn't content with being second, third, fourth, fifth, best, whatever his position was. He wanted the position that God occupied. He was full of jealousy and envy is what the Scripture says. And so he desired to be able to take the place that God was occupying, but he couldn't do it with just the power that he was created with because, again, that was a delegated power that if he would have rebelled, it would have instantly been taken away and he would have been destroyed. But I believe what he saw was that God gave man something he never gave angels. And that was an unconditional, unqualified, no reservations, no strings attached authority. And because of this, Satan saw that if he could get Adam and Eve to yield to him and rebel at God's instructions and instead follow his instructions, then there was a principle of God. Even though this wasn't written in Scripture... You know, the Bible says that the things of God are settled from the beginning, that the Lord never changes. He's the same. And so His creation has always operated under these laws. And Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So even though that Scripture wasn't written yet, that was still the laws of God. That was the way the kingdom worked. And if Satan could trick Adam and Eve into obeying him and yielding to him, then he could become their master. He could take the authority that was given to mankind and use it to begin to start thwarting the kingdom of God and start receiving this praise and adoration and glory that he desired. I believe that's what happened. It would be very similar to a person who wants to go in and rob a bank. You know, a bank has guards there and all of these different things, and one person with a gun really is not able to go in and overpower all of the security and the things that a bank has. But you know what they will do? They'll go in and they'll grab a hostage, and then they'll put that gun to the hostage head, and they know that the goodness of the people who run that bank, they aren't wanting to kill a hostage just to get that money. And so here's a person with maybe only one weapon, with maybe only six bullets in it or something like that, who will challenge a far greater force, maybe multiple people that might have automatic guns that could have 20 or 30 rounds apiece. Technically, they could not overcome this power, but they use a hostage to basically uh, get away with robbery. And in a sense, Satan, see, could not have overcome God, but he saw that God gave Adam and Eve an authority that had zero limitations. And if they of their own free will yielded to him, then they would transfer that authority to Satan. And God, as owner, I believe that as the creator, he still could have come down and wiped out the world, have wiped out Adam and Eve, have wiped out the devil and all of the angels that rebelled. I believe as creator, he had that right and authority. But to intervene. Now, he could, have, he could have called our account due and have just wiped out the universe and have started over. But if he wanted to intervene in the affairs of this world, he didn't have the right to do that because he gave the control, the authority to rule this earth to physical human beings. And he would have violated his own word. The world would have self-destructed because it's held together by the integrity of his word is what it says in Hebrews 1.3. For God to maintain His integrity and to stand by what He said, He gave Adam and Eve unconditional, unbridled authority over this earth. And if they wanted to turn it over to Lucifer, then technically that was their right to do it. He would have been unjust to come down here and wipe everybody out. Now, He, he could have done it as judgment, but I'm talking about as far as just coming down and destroying Satan and saying, Adam and Eve, don't do this and redeeming them. See, he couldn't do that. They had that choice. And so, in a sense, what Satan did, he used Adam and Eve as a hostage. He was gambling on the fact that God would not come down and wipe out this creation that he had made. Apparently, Lucifer 
saw the great love that God had for Adam and Eve. He met with them every single day in the cool of the evening. You know, God, after creating the whole universe, billions and billions of stars and worlds, He's bound to have had things to do. Amen. And yet, He spent time every single day with Adam and Eve. Lucifer saw that God loved Adam and Eve so much, he was gambling on the fact that God wouldn't kill the hostage. In a sense, he had Adam and Eve as a hostage. He was hiding behind them and saying, God, they gave me this authority. It was their choice. I didn't force them. Satan didn't come with a mammoth and put his foot on Eve's head and threaten her. He didn't come and overpower them. He came with deception, and they willingly yielded to him. And this is where his transgression took place, was in the Garden of Eden. And he used Adam and Eve like a hostage, saying, God, if you want to do anything to me, you're going to have to destroy Adam and Eve, because they did it of their own free will. And because of God's great love for mankind, I believe that God allowed Satan to become the God of this world. Instead of wiping him out and starting this whole thing over, God allowed what we did. We are the ones that create, or not created would be the wrong word, but we are the ones that made Satan. We are the ones that allowed Lucifer to leave his angelic state and come into a fallen state and rule as the God over this world. We were originally intended to be gods over this world, absolute rulers and controllers. And mankind gave their dominion and their authority to Lucifer. So in a real sense, God created Lucifer, but you know what? Adam and Eve created Satan. Again, probably it's more accurate to say Adam and Eve made Satan. He was already created. Everything that, has, that exists came from God. But Adam and Eve are the one that made Satan who he was. They gave him their authority and power. Here are some of the applications of this. And I think that this is vital that you get this point right here. Most people believe that Satan is using a superior power and authority to mankind. Most people see Satan as this huge, powerful being who is so much superior to any of us. You know, recently there was some kind of a show. I just saw a little brief thing on TV. I don't watch this kind of stuff, and I really didn't pay a lot of attention. But there was some kind of a show come out about some demonic uh, being, and they showed this power, I mean strong, powerful being, and they portrayed Satan that way. And this is the way that most people, non-Christian and Christian, perceive the devil as being a superior being in power and authority. But if you follow the things that I've been saying, here's one of the applications. Satan's power as an angel, when he was Lucifer, I believe that it stopped the moment that he transgressed against God. Satan is not using a superior power, and the authority that Satan is using is actually the authority that God gave mankind over this earth. Now, that is a major statement. That means that when we are resisting the devil and fighting against him, Satan doesn't have a superior power or authority to come at us with. Satan actually has no power, no authority on his own. The power and the authority that he's using is actually the power and the authority that God gave physical human beings on this earth. He is powerless. Satan didn't have any power. Even under the old covenant, Satan did not have power to control and dominate people. He had to use our power, and it was only as we submitted unto him that Satan is able to do anything. Now, that is a major point. Here's another way of saying this. If you would look over in, uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 5, I'm not sure exactly where this is, but where Jesus cast the demons out of the, uh, out of the man and the demons named themselves as legion. You know that these demons begged Jesus and said, don't cast us out into the deep, but send us into this herd of swine. And Jesus allowed all of these demons to enter into this herd of swine. It says that there was about 2,000 in the herd of swine. And when the demons entered into them, they ran violently down this steep place and perished in the sea. Pigs have more sense than a lot of people do. In the sense. People will brag 
about the demonic stuff that they do, about their homosexual lifestyle, have gay parades and put out banners and talk about their demon-possessed things. And yet pigs, when demons entered into them, they killed themselves. Pigs have a lot more wisdom than some people do. But anyway, here's the point that I was trying to make. And that is that these demons begged Jesus to let them enter into that, those pigs. You know why? Because Satan's power that he's using against us, Satan himself or any of his imps, any of these demons, the power that they are using against us is our own power that was given to physical human beings. Satan has zero angelic power, spiritual power, and his authority all comes from man. The only reason Satan exists and functions is because people cooperate and we are the ones that actually empower the devil. That is the reason that Satan always, always seeks to inhabit a body. Because even a pig has more authority than a demon. Man, that's quite a statement. An ant, a fly, a snail... A bug has more power on this earth than Satan does. Satan is absolutely powerless to do anything unless he gets a physical body to cooperate with him. Now, see, this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis in chapter 1. I've already read some of these scriptures to you. But in Genesis chapter 1, when the Lord uh, created us, He's the one who is the author of all power And authority is just the right to use power. And God gave that right to use power to Adam and Eve. It says here in Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. You know, when he says you have dominion, you subdue, you control, basically he's saying, here's my power, now I give you the right, the authority to use my power. Everything I have created will respond to you. God set up this world that way. And notice, the people that He spoke this to had physical human bodies. Now, God is a spirit, John 4, 24. Satan also is a spirit. And we see that in a number of scriptures, talking about the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience and others that we've already used in this series. Satan doesn't have a physical body. Therefore, Satan cannot just come and make a person do anything. Boy, this is imperative that you get this, because a lot of people, even Christians today, are seeing Satan as being an angelic being with godly, supernatural power and authority to man. And they see Satan as coming and overpowering them, when the truth is, Satan cannot force you to do anything. Satan lost his angelic power when he rebelled at God, and the only power and authority that he is functioning under is human authority. It takes your cooperation for Satan to do anything in your life. Boy, that is super powerful. That has literally set me free. And see, because this is true, this is the reason that, like I was stating in our first teaching on this, Satan is just waiting He is going about seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't have the power or the authority to devour you, but instead he's looking for people who will quit obeying God and will start obeying him, that will get into lust, that will get into sin, that will get into rebellion, that will get into strife and unforgiveness and all of these things. And as we yield to those things, Romans 6.16 says, you yield yourself to the author of those things, Satan. You are empowering him. Satan cannot come in and just destroy everybody, but he has to have cooperation. Satan can't do anything to me without my cooperation. Man, that is one awesome statement. And see, most people don't see it this way because they see Satan. They know that the origin, according to the Scripture, was that he was created and he was an angelic being, and angels have a higher power than what we do but they don't have the authority to exercise that power in the earth. 
And so we assume that Satan, see, has this superior power and authority, and people are intimidated by him. But Satan lost all of his angelic power when he rebelled, and his authority is totally tied to us. He doesn't have a physical body. God gave authority over this earth, everything that's going on in this earth, to physical human beings. And without a physical body, Satan is absolutely powerless unless we empower him by yielding to him and indulging his lust, his lies, his anger, his bitterness, etc. Well, that's powerful. So see, this is what goes on. This is the reason that our actions are so important. Because this physical body is what gives you authority here in this earth. Did you know that Paul doesn't have any power or influence over you today? You know why? Paul is still alive. People don't cease to exist. Paul still exists, but he's no longer in a physical body. The only influence that he has on anybody today are the physical writings that he left behind. And people can read that, and that way he can influence them. He doesn't have the authority to function and operate any longer on this earth because he doesn't have a physical body. I've got a physical body. I've got more authority and power on this earth than the Apostle Paul has right now because he's lost his earth suit. This earth suit is what empowers me and gives me authority. And Satan can't do anything without somebody in an earth suit with a physical body yielding to him. And this is the reason he's constantly vying for your heart and to get you to yield to him through anger, fear, hurt, pain, depression, all of these kind of things. The reason he's doing all of these things is because every time you go away from what God's Word says and receiving his ability and you act in union with what Satan is trying to do, you yield to him authority and power. So he can only function as he keeps people submitted unto him through these lies and through this deception. And sad to say, one of the weapons of his deception has been the church. The church is taught that Satan is a superior force, that Satan is a superior power. Satan isn't. Actually, Satan is using nothing but human power, human authority. And it has to have our cooperation for him to work. Now, am I saying that he's not a factor? Yes, he's a factor. And there are so many people on the face of the earth today who are yielded to Satan, who are operating in sexual immorality, lies, deception, hurt, fear, all of these kind of things. Every time we yield to one of these negative things, we empower the devil. And so, through so many millions of people yielding to Satan today, he is a factor. And he has to be dealt with. But as far as my life goes, Satan cannot do anything individually in my life without my cooperation. And understanding this and recognizing that the power and the authority that Satan has is the human power. The power that God actually gave to me, a physical human being, to rule and to reign over this earth. It has put everything in a totally different context. And now, see, instead of being intimidated by the devil, man, I have boldness towards the devil. I know that he exists. I'm not taking it for granted. I'm aware that if I was to go out and start doing the wrong things in my actions, in my speech, in my emotions... If I was to indulge these negative emotions, I believe that Satan would take advantage of it. He'd come in and eat my lunch and pop the bag. I believe that that exists. I am not ignorant of the devil's devices. I'm not being, uh, you know, uh, passive towards him. I'm resisting him, but I'm not afraid of the devil. I realize that all he's doing is coming against me with my own human authority and power. Let's go back to a scripture that I used at the very beginning of this teaching out of Ephesians chapter 6. And if you followed what I said, now this ought to make a lot more sense to you. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what the word wiles means? It literally means cunningness, craftiness, deception. Satan's only power is deception. He doesn't have power to force you to do anything. Satan cannot make you sin. I have people come to me all the time and say, I don't want to commit sexual sin, but I just don't have power. Satan is stronger than I am. It's not true. 
Satan doesn't have the power or the authority to force you to do anything. But the problem is, he is a master liar. He's a master intimidator, deceiver. It's all deception. And if we don't know the truth, if we don't know who we are and the power that we have, then in a very real sense, we are the one who are giving Satan the power and the authority to rule and dominate us. You can break that. You know, I had a woman in our Bible college just this last week. I was talking to them about some things. And they had an area of their life that they admitted. They said, I know that I'm wrong in this area. But it's just a thing with me. It's like rebellion. And I want to break it, but there's just something in me that I have trouble doing this. I just can't seem to overcome it. And I told them, I said, here's the way you do it. I said, do that thing that you know you're supposed to do, but you don't feel like doing it. Do it. Do it every day. And they said, but I just don't feel like it. And I said, you know what? If you will start obeying and yielding your actions to God, then that will allow God to be strengthened. And as you quit obeying and yielding your body to the devil, it will weaken the devil. That's the reason the Bible says you have to stand against the wiles, the deception, the lies, the deceit of the devil. Satan is out to deceive you. And he is doing a good job of it today with all of the help and the support that he gets from people. Man, our airwaves are full of things that are just putting forth untruths, causing you to lust and to commit immorality and to do things that God never intended you to do. And every time you yield to those things, you are the one that empowers the devil to come in and to destroy your life. So God is a spirit. It says in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Satan is a spirit. And I'm going to say something here that may shock some of you, but what's new? Amen. Seems like I just contradict a tremendous amount of religious doctrine and thinking today. But you know what? God turned the control, the authority, the dominion, over this earth, over to physical human beings. And since God is a spirit, when mankind misused that authority and used it in a way that God told them not to do, but when they did that, God would have been unjust to come down here and intervene in the affairs of man and just straighten this whole mess out because God was a spirit. And He didn't have the authority to actually straighten out this mess. Now, he had the power, and he as a judge could have just said, all right, I'm tired of the whole mess. I'm going to wipe out the entire human race. In a sense, he came close to doing that during the flood, during the days of Noah when he sent the flood. And as the creator and as the owner, I believe he always had that right and privilege. God could do that. But outside of total judgment, if he wanted to come into the affairs of man and change the way that things were going, he didn't have the authority to do that. He had given the authority to rule and subdue this earth to mankind. And even though they used it in a way contrary to what he wanted, he would have been unjust, untrue to his own statements to come down here and violate that. And for those of you who will listen and think and follow through with this logic, this will really help you. But this is the reason that God had to become a man. This is the reason that God had to send His Son, the Lord Jesus, to this earth. It all comes back to this authority issue, and authority was given to people that had physical human bodies. God didn't have a physical human body, so therefore He wasn't free to just operate unrestricted in this earth. He had to become a man. And this is why Jesus had to be a physical person so that he could have authority in this earth. I don't know if you think this way or not, but, you know, I ask questions like this. I've asked questions before about, God, why did you establish that you had to send Jesus to bear our sins and to die for our sins? Couldn't you have saved mankind some other way? And the answer that I've gotten from that is, no, he couldn't because God didn't have a physical body. Therefore, he was limited in what he could do until he obtained a physical body. He tried to work through people. The Scripture says that the Lord sought for a man and wondered that there was no intercessor to stand into the gap. Therefore, he says, my own hand will bring me deliverance. 
And the Lord basically said that He looked, but every person had been corrupted. Every person had been deceived by the devil and was under Satan's control. And because of that, there was no person who was sinless and who was pure and who was able to bring God's total righteousness into this earth. And so, therefore, the only answer was God had to save this world Himself. But how could He do it? Because He had turned control of this earth over to physical human beings. Well, the way He did it was He became a man. God Himself took up on uh, Himself flesh and limited Himself to a physical body. Man, that is amazing. As a matter of fact, I've got a separate teaching on this. I'm not going to go into this, but I've got a tape set entitled Lessons from the Christmas Story. And I think that I had a tape in there. I think the title of it is God's Word, the Incorruptible Seed. And anyway, that goes through this whole thing and gives you the logic of talking about this authority, how God had to speak the body of Adam into existence. And that was when he had authority and absolute control over this earth. And he spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke Adam and Eve's body into existence. He said, let us make man. He said it. That's the way that God created in the first place was by speaking words. And then after He created Adam and Eve, He spoke words and gave them authority, dominion over this earth. And by doing that, He limited His own authority. And now that man corrupted themselves and sold out to the devil and made Satan the god of this world, God was not in control. He wasn't in absolute control. Didn't have dominion. He had turned that over to man. And therefore, he wasn't able to speak the physical body of Jesus into existence just on his own. What he had to do was speak to the spirits of men, the spirit that indwelt them, and then they would take those words and speak them out of their mouth. And it literally took 4,000 years for the Lord to find enough men who would operate in enough faith to speak the things that need to be spoken for, for Jesus' body to be created. Man, that's awesome. He spoke all of these prophecies. Isaiah came out and said, A virgin shall conceive. There's no telling how many people God tried to inspire to say that. But you know what? There's not very many prophets that would stand up and say, A virgin is going to have a child. It took a lot of faith to say that. It took 4,000 years for the Lord to find people that He could speak all of these things about the Lord Jesus. And then, when the angel appeared unto Mary, He told Mary what was going to happen, and she humbled herself and said, So be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel took those prophecies, these spoken words of God, and the Word entered into Mary's womb, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God created the physical body for Jesus to inhabit by speaking words over a 4,000 year period of time through anointed men. And then those words entered into the womb of Mary and that's how Jesus was conceived. And that's why He had authority on earth to do the things that He did. Satan was in trouble now because God had always had the power, but He had turned the authority over this earth over to physical human beings. And since John 24 says that God is a spirit, then in a sense, God limited His own intervention in the affairs of man because He didn't have a physical body. When man turned around and gave this authority and power to the devil, Satan began to oppress the human race. God wanted to redeem us, but He had to have some physical human being, a person with a physical body, here on the earth so that they could have power and go in and do warfare with the devil. In a sense, it's like, you know, when you're under an umbrella, you, that umbrella is shielding you from the rain that's falling. The rain may be there, but it isn't touching you because you're under this umbrella. Well, Satan, when he rebelled at God, came under the authority that God had given to mankind. And that's what Satan used. He deceived men, men submitted unto him, and therefore that authority, this human authority, was kind of a shield that kept God from getting to the devil and really doing to the devil, stripping him of all of his power. He was shielded from that because God had said only people with physical human bodies had authority on this earth. And so that's the reason that Jesus had to become a man. Now here's Jesus saying this in his own words. 
out of John chapter 5. And I'm going to break right into the midst of this. But in John chapter 5, verse 26, it says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Now, Jesus said the reason he had authority to execute judgment was because he was the Son of Man. Now, the term Son of Man and Son of God are used, both of those terms are used to refer to Jesus. But if you study this out, you'll find out that when the Son of Man is used, that's referring to the humanity, the physical side of Jesus. When the term Son of God is used, that's referring to the divinity, almighty presence of God that indwelt the body of Jesus. The Jesus existed before the worlds began. The Scripture shows us in Colossians that He created all things. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that. And so Jesus was God, but Jesus was also man. He was a God-man. And the way that you refer to the humanity side is this term, the Son of Man. And so when Jesus said that the Father had given him authority to execute judgment because he was the Son of Man, he was making a direct reference to the fact that he had a physical body. That's what gave him authority. Now, he always had power as creator, but he didn't have the authority to use that. Again, this is somewhat hard for some of us to comprehend because we honestly don't follow the rules. I mean, people will say things like, you know, I promise you I'll do this, and if it's inconvenient, they'll just break their word. They'll violate it. People don't have a lot of integrity. They don't follow these things, but God never breaks His word. And when He told mankind, you have dominion, then He limited His dominion over this earth by giving that power to us. You know, one time I gave a car to one of my employees who was believing God for a car, and I was believing God for a better car. I got a better car, and I gave my old car to them. And it was a very nice car. It was brand new when I got it, and we had only used it about two years or three years. And anyway, I gave this car to them to be a blessing to them. And I signed the title over, and it was their car. It was an absolute gift. And you know, about a year or so later, this guy came to me and asked if it would be okay with me if he sold that car and used it as a trade-in on getting a better car. And I told him, I said, look, you can do anything with that car you want to. It's not my car, it's yours. But see, he felt like that he kind of needed to get my permission. But see, that, that wasn't true. Legally, in every way, I gave him that car and it was his. If he wanted to park it at the curb and charge $10 for people to take a sledgehammer and beat the thing up and raise money that way, he could have done anything with it he wanted to. Now, see, I believe that that's integrity. If I gave a person a car, signed it over to him and says it's yours, and then later I find them selling, uh, you know, swings with a sledgehammer for 10 bucks, and that's not what I intended, but if I truly gave it to him, and if there was no strings attached, it would be wrong for me to come up and say something because that's, that's not my business. It's his. It's, he has the authority over that. Well, that's the way that God gave authority over this earth to us. We just want to say, well, King's X, time's out. I didn't intend this. Let's stop. Let's do it over. But see, God's not like that. God has integrity. And because of this, this is the reason it took 4,000 years for Jesus to show up on the scene and set the account straight it was because God was a spirit and He couldn't just intervene in the affairs of man. He had given the dominion the authority over this earth to physical human beings. And so God Himself was limited until He became a physical human being. He wasn't only physical, but He inhabited a physical body, and now the devil was in trouble. Because in a sense, He had been using Adam and Eve like a hostage to say, God, if you do anything to me, you'll have to get to Adam and Eve. You'll have to destroy these people that you made. But now, Jesus became one of the hostages. Jesus became a physical human being. And He entered into the kingdom of the devil. And I mean destroyed Satan, took away all authority, all power from him. And Satan is now reduced to being a zero with the rim knocked off. He has zippo, zilch, nada 
zero power and authority against us. The only thing that Satan can do is tempt us. And if we yield to him, we're doing the same thing that Adam did. We are yielding our human power and authority. Satan cannot do anything to you without your consent, without your cooperation. I tell you, if you're listening, this is just going against so much of what the church is taught. Most people believe that Satan is a major force to be reckoned with. I believe he exists, and I believe that, yes, you can't just be ignorant of his devices, as it says in Scripture. We need to know what's going on. But I tell you, Satan is not someone to be feared. Satan is someone that you have to be knowledgeable of, and you have to learn to resist him. But Satan can do nothing without my consent or my cooperation. Boy, that has transformed my life. And see, understanding this has given me a tremendous advantage over the devil. Now I recognize that, you know what, if I don't want, if I'm having a feeling, a desire, a drawing, a lust in some direction, all I've got to do is with my physical body quit yielding to those things that is allowing Satan to draw me in that way and use my physical body to go exactly the opposite direction. And what I do with my physical body either releases the power of God or releases the power of the devil. Here's an example of what I'm talking about, that when Jamie and I first got into the ministry, I was working some to help uh, meet the bills. And, you know, we needed this money desperately. We were really struggling financially. And I came home one day from a painting job, and I was so sick that I could hardly stand up. I mean, I wanted to lay down. I did lay down on the couch, and Jamie was fixing me some lunch, and she came in there and asked what I was doing. And I said, oh, man, I feel sick. I don't know if I'm going to be able to eat or anything. And see, we had taught these exact things about how you have to use your body and quit yielding to the devil. Quit cooperating with the devil. Do the very thing that you don't feel like doing. Resist. Fight against with your physical actions. And I felt like laying down on the couch. Jamie came in there and got me up, put my arm around her shoulder, and she started dragging me through that house, saying, we need this money. You will go back to that job. You are healed. And she made me get up and start acting healed. Amen. She just forced me to do it. And you know, the good news is, in about ten minutes, I was over it, and I was well, and praise God, I went back to work, and we got paid that day. But see, I've learned that. The night before I was going to be ordained to the ministry, this must have been back, I'm not totally sure when this was, but it must have been back uh, somewhere around 72 or something like that, maybe 73. And uh, I was going to be ordained to the ministry. I went out to open up my garage door in Seagaville, Texas, and the thing was broken and it caught and I just popped my back. And I mean, I had so much pain. It knocked me to the ground. And I had my young son there. He was only a year old or something like that. And I said, Joshua, go tell mommy. And uh, he just sat there and talked to me. Finally, eventually, he wandered in the house, brought Jamie out. And when she came out, she saw me laying there. And I was hurting so bad, all I could do was whisper and say, I hurt my back. And she said, well, get up. And she pulled me up, prayed over me. And she says, now, you act on the Word of God. Again, we needed me to be able to work. So she cut me no slack. And anyway, it's a long story, but you know what? I started doing things with my physical body. I got, I mean, my shoulders were back like this. My shoulder blades in the back were touching each other. And uh, I was having excruciating pain. And I finally got to where over about a day's period of time, I was doing sit-ups, push-ups, doing things that I didn't feel like doing. I got my movement back, but my shoulders were still pulled back. So I went to bed that night, got up the next day, the day that I was going to be ordained. My shoulders were still back. It's a long story, but I just kept fighting that thing. And right before I went to that service, I said, I am going to act healed. I am going to go there and be ordained. And I went, and by the time I got there, I was healed. And praise God, my actions were a major part of that healing. You can't lay in bed and act sick and at the same time release the supernatural power of God. God is a spirit, and He gave control, dominion over this earth to physical human beings. So that limited His own dominion, His own authority. I know that that's very offensive to some people, 
and they think, I just can't believe that you're saying that God is limited in any way. Well, let me just show you one passage of Scripture here. Psalms chapter um, 78 and verse 41. I'll break right into the midst of it, but it says, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. There's a scriptural basis right there saying that you can limit God. And this same thing is said in so many different ways. The sixth chapter of the book of Mark, Jesus went into his hometown and it said he could do no mighty works. Not that he didn't want to do, but he couldn't do mighty works because of their unbelief. The Lord had to have cooperation from people to release his power into their life. You know, this is something that just flies in the face of some people to say that God doesn't control everything that goes on, that He's limited in any way. He's not limited in the sense that He doesn't have the power, but He gave authority and dominion over this earth to physical human beings, and because of His own integrity, He would not violate His own Word. So therefore, you could say He limited His own sovereignty. He limited His own intervention. And until he became a physical being himself, he didn't have the authority to come down to this earth and straighten out the mess that man created. And that's why Jesus had to become flesh and dwell among us. He had to become a physical human body so that he could have authority. And that's exactly what he said in John chapter 5, verse 27, that God the Father had given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man, referring to his humanity side, his physical body. So God himself operates within these laws of authority. God himself would not violate that. You know, I feel sometimes like I'm wasting my effort to try and make this point because we live in a culture today where authority is not a big issue. People, basically, they don't submit themselves to authority. They only do what they are forced and demanded to do. But they really don't recognize authority. There's people that just violate this all the time. You know, and again, I know that this could be misunderstood and taken the wrong way. I'm not meaning this to be critical. But as a whole, the younger generation doesn't respect authority the way that the older generation does. They've been raised in a generation where you violate everything and basically it's whatever you can get by with. I heard a statistic on the radio just this last week that I forgot the exact numbers, but it was a majority of students nowadays say that they cheat and they don't see anything wrong with it. They aren't submitted to authority. They, they just think that as long as you don't get caught, everything is, is fine. But see, that's absolutely wrong. All of life is based on authority. It really is. I teach my students this, and one thing I tell them often is that you have to earn the right to speak into a person's life. You have to gain their respect. I believe that this works on every level. I believe that this is one reason that evangelism has been offensive the way it has is because people come up and just stick a track in your face and you're going to go to hell, repent, and they try and get that person to submit to them and they haven't earned this person's respect. They didn't even introduce themselves. They didn't even use common courtesy to, you know, come up and say, how are you? How's your day going or anything? They just come up and, I mean, it's in your face. And I believe that that's absolutely wrong. I've had people come up to me before. I remember a time in Kansas City where a guy came up to me and just started railing on my wife and talking about the way she dressed. And if you were a man of God, you'd straighten this out. You'd make her do this, this, and this. And he started telling me all of his opinions about how Jamie dressed. And, of course, most of you don't know Jamie. She doesn't like to be in front of a camera. But I can tell you that my wife is a very conservative dresser. She has never done anything inappropriate. There is nothing wrong. What he was talking about was she had on some gold, like a gold wedding ring. She had on some jewelry. And because she had makeup on, he was criticizing those kind of things. It was this old legalistic type stuff. And he was railing on my wife. And I basically just stopped the whole thing by saying, I told this guy, I said, who are you? And he told me his name. And I said, no, I mean, who gave you the right and the authority? I said, you had no dominion. You had no authority over my wife. I said, God didn't die and appoint you to take his place. You are nobody. I said, I don't care what your opinion is. And this guy was just, 
highly offended, like, how dare you speak to me this way? But the way I looked at it is, see, that if he's going to confront me and come and start railing on me, and here he is telling me to do something, then I just respond in kind and tell him, you know what, guy, you hadn't got any authority in my life. I don't give a rip about your opinion. I know some people take offense at that, but it's really true. I would never go to the President of the United States and walk in and tell him what to do. And you know what? It's not because I feel inferior. It's not because I don't believe that God has given me an opinion. I know that there are certain things. I believe that I have standards that I could help. I could say things. But I would have to earn that right. He would have to request it. I am not his superior. It would be the same thing, you know, just like the person that's the mail clerk in a business. He may have some ideas at work, but you don't go to the CEO and start telling the CEO what to do. You've got to be under authority. Now, if they're a good CEO, they will encourage feedback, and they'll even go to the hourly workers and sometimes ask them, what do you think? But it's really voluntary. You don't have the right. You don't have the authority to go to somebody. I would never go to some of these ministers that I see on radio and television and go to rebuking them and telling them things. And I can guarantee you, I've listened to some of them on television that I can tell you that they are absolutely wrong. I can tell you, I've got a revelation of the Word and I could help them. But I respect that person enough that, you know what, I am not their superior. They don't submit to me. We don't have that rapport built up. And I would never do those things. And yet, on a consistent basis, nearly every day, I'll have somebody who considers themselves to be the official standard of what's right and wrong that will ream me up one side and down the other, and they've never witnessed to a person. They've never seen a person set free. They've never done anything, and yet they think that they know it all. You know what? If you just understood authority, you could stop those kind of abuses. You know what? You have to earn the right to speak into a person's life. I told my students this before. I said, you know what, there's things I know about some of you sitting out there, but I know what's going on and I know that there's some problems, but if these problems are outside of school. And if you haven't come to me and if we haven't built a rapport to where I feel like that you've opened up to me and given me the freedom in your life, I'm not going to come to you and tell you those kind of things because it's not my place. It's none of my business. I'll deal with things that affect people while they're at our Bible college, but you know what? I'm not going to pry in their personal life. Some people just think, well, that's wrong. You ought to do that. Well, no, I think it's wrong for you to stick your nose into other people's business. See, it really does come down to authority. And there, God is a God of authority. He set in place structure, and He's not going to circumvent the situation. When I have employees that have a problem with a superior, I tell them, I said, you go to your superior and talk to them. Don't circumvent them. Don't come to me. Don't try and get me to counter their opinion. And you know what? It works better that way. That's the way that God is. God established authority. And we've got to recognize this. God Himself obeyed this. God Himself would not intervene in the affairs of man until He became a man. Until He took upon Himself the form of flesh. And then he had the authority to take it to the devil. Man, that's good news. So as we've talked about all of this, if you understand that Satan did not get his authority directly from God, this isn't a superior angelic power that he has over, over the human race. He was, he was stripped of all of his angelic power and authority, and the power and authority that Satan has used to rule this earth has been mankind's authority that God gave them. Satan can do nothing in your life without your consent and cooperation. Boy, that is an awesome, awesome truth. And see, by understanding this, it puts Satan down on a plane to where he's still a threat because he does have the power to lie to you. He's a master deceiver, and so you have to know the truth and you have to be on guard. But he is not a superior foe. It makes it so that, you know what, I believe I can win this battle. I believe that I can take the power and the authority that God has given me and I can confront the devil and I'm no longer afraid of him. I'm not ignorant of him, but I'm not afraid of him. And because of it, man, I have seen some awesome things happen just because of recognizing that Satan has been defeated. You know, I remember that there was a time when uh, I first came in to the knowledge that Satan existed. I'm like most people. 
I was raised in typical America, and I honestly just didn't think about demons. I'd heard about I read about them in the Bible, but I thought all of the demons were in Africa. I didn't think that there were demons here. I didn't think that we physically encountered demons. And when I first got really turned on to the Lord and began to look at the Bible and realize it was real, and it's real today just like it was 2,000 years ago, I began to recognize that a lot of things were demonic. A lot of sicknesses were demonic. And we began to start casting demons out of people. And we saw a lot of things happen. I mean, it was miraculous. And anyway, one of the very first things that happened was that my grandmother, who raised me up until the time I was about six years old, and then she went senile, and anyway, she died when I was eight years old. But for a period of time, she was kind of the one that raised me. That probably explains why I'm so messed up to some of you who don't like me, amen. But anyway, this woman, she got senile in her last years, and she died, and it's my opinion. I can't prove any of these things, you know, like in a way that would satisfy a total skeptic. But it's my opinion that when she died, she left some of those demons in that room. And I remember that right after she died, I moved out of a room that I was sharing with my brother, and I moved into that room that my grandmother had occupied, and we had a picture of her sitting up on this dresser. And at night, uh, that picture would come alive. It would come off of that, out of that frame, and her image would go around that room. I was only about an eight, nine-year-old boy, and it scared the fire out of me. But I knew it wasn't supposed to be this way. I knew it was strange. I was afraid that if I went and told my mother and my dad what was going on, they were going to think I was crazy, and so I just didn't say anything about it. But you know what? As soon as possible, I moved out of that room and back into the room that I was sharing with my brother. Well, he thought, I'll take that other room. He moved in there. You know what? It wasn't a month, and he moved out of there. And then my sister moved in there. Wasn't a month, she moved out of there. And eventually, I mean, from the time I was eight until probably I was 19 or 20, for all of that period of time, we kept that room locked up in our house. Nobody ever said anything, but nobody liked being in there. People that would come visit. I had Bible studies. They'd go into every room in the house and pray with people and do things, but nobody would go in that room. And I remember when my niece came home when I was 14 years old. And my sister brought my niece home. And uh, she would be sound asleep. They'd walk into that room and that baby would go to cry and walk out and she'd be okay. Walk in, she'd cry. Walk out and she's okay. I mean, even after a while, my lightning fast mind began to figure out something was wrong uh, in there. And when I came aware that demons were real and that they did exercise influence... I one day was walking in that house, and we always kept the door to that room closed. And I just decided that, you know what, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to cast those demons out and rid this house of those demons. And so I went in, shut the door behind me, and I went to rebuking and binding, and I mean all of the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. There was fear. I had goosebumps all over me. It was like, and I was thinking, I remember having this exact thought that, oh, God, yeah, I'm so glad I can't see into the spirit realm because if I could, I'd see these huge demons towering over me with fangs and claws. And, you know, I, I just was envisioning this demonic power that it was only the name of Jesus that was holding them at bay. They were only inches away from absolutely destroying me. And I was praying like that. Oh, thank you, God, that I can't see what's going on in the spirit realm. And as soon as I had that thought, you know what? The Lord turned around and He said, Andrew, He says... If I was to show you into the spirit realm, instead of seeing these huge, powerful demons with fangs and claws, what you'd see are little tiny imps. I mean, little tiny things. And you would be amazed. They are nothing. They just got big mouths. They know how to scream loud. They know how to intimidate you. They say and boast great things, but they can't deliver. And you know what? When the Lord changed that image from towering demons to little tiny imps who had no power and authority, I mean, it was like the Incredible Hulk. Instead of fear, instead faith rose up. A spirit of might came on me, and I mean boldness came on me, and boom, just like that, I got rid of those demons. And you know what? Again, some people think, well, this is just all in your mind. But without me telling a single person, like I said, we held Bible studies in there. They would never go into that room. I never told anybody. It just for years, nobody would go into that room. 
without me telling a single person. That night when we had Bible study, guess what? People went right into that room. Nobody thought a thing about it. I guarantee there was a difference. Uh, you may not believe that, but I believe that, and that's the reason it worked. Let me share this passage of Scripture with you out of Isaiah chapter 14. This is written about the devil in verse 4. It says, Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. It may look like that this is speaking to the king of Babylon. That's who it's addressed to. But down here in verse 12, it calls him Lucifer. And so, I believe that this is talking about the demonic power that was operating through the king of Babylon. In verse 5, it says, The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nation in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, saying, I mean, it stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm it spread, is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look on thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world a wilderness? and destroyed the, ch the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. And on and on it goes. But this is how they're going to respond to Satan. And of course, this has all come to pass now because Jesus literally destroyed Satan. And if you had the proper attitude, just like I was that time praying and thinking in my mind that these demons were strong, powerful things, and yet the Lord says, nope, they're little imps. They don't have any power and authority. This is what it's saying. When we see Satan... We're going to say, is this the one that intimidated me? Is this the one that I let ruin my life? Is this the one that I let keep me in bondage? This nothing? This zero? I tell you, that's the way that Satan is. Satan does not have the power that the church has imputed unto him. Satan's only power that he has came from man. Mankind made Satan. We are the ones that empowered him. God created him Lucifer, a godly influence, an angelic being. But mankind gave him his authority and power. And it is only a physical, human authority and power that he uses. That's the reason he has to have a body to possess. That's the reason that a pig has more power and authority. And the demons beg Jesus to let them enter into the pigs. Because a pig had more power than the demons had. Satan is a factor, but only because people yield to him. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And that's what we've been sharing. Man, this is good, good news. Thank you.